everyone for coming. Um, fantastic that we have uh, Dr. John, Tom Doyle from University College Cork. He's going to talk to us today about Irish jellyfish. Um, it's a fascinating subject, so he's going to take us through his, his experiences. Um, it's, he's worked 17 years on this topic, so he has a lot to share with us. Um, Tom? Thanks, Sinead, and uh, welcome everybody. It's, it's uh, fantastic to be here this evening and uh, to see so many people excited about jellyfish. So, um, so okay, I'm, I'm Tom Dial from University College Cork, and we're here tonight in association with Clean Coast. So, um, so they organized this, so it's, it's a great idea. So I'm gonna give an introductory talk about jellyfish. So jellyfish is something, you know, most of you or all of you are familiar with jellyfish. They're a very distinctive group of animals. They're round, you know, so there's very few animals that have this round shape. They're transparent. And of course, many of them wash up on our beaches. So we'd be very familiar with them from that. But many of them are also very striking and have very unusual um, uh, patterns, colors, um, like some of these pictures I'm putting up here now. But of course, Jellyfish also sting, and I guess that's what people probably know jellyfish best for, is, is that they've probably been stung at some stage in, in, in their lives. So it raises the question, so you're all familiar with them, but what are jellyfish? Well, they're members of the phylum Cnidaria, which includes corals and sea anemones. So I have some pictures up here of, of a coral reef and of a beadlet sea anemone, and of course a, a compass jellyfish beside it. So What's the, the, what's, what, do they, what do they share in common, I guess, is the question. Well, just like ourselves, we're, we're members of the phylum Chordata. And being members of the phylum Chordata, we, we, um, we, have, we all have backbones. And um, so reptiles, birds, fish, all these animals have a backbone. And that's what makes them a, a member of the phylum Chordata. But jellyfish belong to the phylum Cnidaria. And what they all share in common is that they have Cnidae. And now they are stinging capsules. And um, there's a couple of different types, but one type that we're gonna focus on is the nematocyst. And you may have heard of that. The nematocyst is a, a stinging capsule and it's what causes the injury. So when you get stung by a jellyfish, and here's a picture of a lion's mane jellyfish, when you get stung by this, that's what um, injects the venom into you. So let's have a, a, a bit of a closer look. So we've zoomed in on a piece of tentacle here and um, so we're just going to look at a tentacle here. We zoom in on it. And now what you can see here is we're looking at these clusters of nematocysts on this tentacle. So you can imagine this is, this is about um, um, a millimeter um, uh, in length here. And so you can see these are very small structures. And if we zoom in on these, we can see here's one cluster of these um, nematocysts. And what you can see is that they're about each one is about 10 microns in, in diameter. So you can see when you brush off a jellyfish, this is what you're actually um, uh, brushing off. And then it triggers each of these nematocysts to fire, which means to just eject out this tubule, which releases some venom at the end of it. Here's a little schematic of that. So this is one of these, we're, gonna, we're, we're looking at one of these um, nematocysts. So here's a nematocyst here. And it's sitting inside a cell which has a little trigger. So when you brush off that trigger, this capsule is is um, is called. Um, so essentially, what it has is this tubule uh, coiled up inside it, which is just a bit like a garden hose coiled up inside. And when it, when the cell is actually triggered, it causes um, a change with inside the cell, which causes uh, water to rush into it, which increases the pressure. And it fires the hose, if you can imagine a, a pressurized hose, it fires it outside. And then that tubule is um, injected into the skin or into, the, into the, um, the, the tissue of the animal that it's trying to feed on. So when you get stung, that's, that's what's actually happening. And we have this, this bit's recorded. Yeah, so this yeah. bit's recorded, so, yeah. so it's just that, that, that first. Perfect. That is actually perfect. You can do it again completely if you want, but like. We'll do, we'll just do, we'll try one more go, just see, and then you can yeah. see which ones, which ones, um, which one's better. Cause I, I got a bit, 
tongue-tied on on um, talking about vertebrates and I don't know if it was necessary but sure we'll, we'll try something different this time. Okay um, I'll just cue you in will I? Yeah um, you don't need a bit just 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 a little bit. Okay um, and, and thanks everyone for joining us today and um, so we're going to kick it over to Tom for the an introductory talk on jellyfish in Ireland. Tom to you. Okay okay Thanks, Sinead, um, and welcome, everybody. It's, it's great to be here this evening. It's great to see so many people um, interested in, in jellyfish. And um, yeah, it, and I'd just like to say a big thank you to Clean Coast for organizing this, um, because I think it's a great idea. And uh, yeah, so I'll just continue on. So this is an introductory talk about Irish jellyfish. My name is Dr. Tom Dial. I'm from University College Cork. And here we are tonight presenting together with Clean Coasts on jellyfish. So jellyfish, well, it's, they're a group of animals that we're all familiar with. They're very distinctive. There's something that wash up on our beaches, so everybody's seen them. They're round, which is unusual. There's very few animals that have that symmetry, that radial symmetry. And um, many of them are transparent, but of course, uh, there's a great diversity as well, and many have some very beautiful striking patterns and colors and, uh, and shapes. But of course, what we all probably remember jellyfish for is the fact that they can sting us. And, uh, and I guess that's why perhaps many of you are interested in jellyfish is you want to learn more about that. But stinging is also why these animals is how they catch their food. Well, what are jellyfish? Well, they're members of the phylum Cnidaria, which includes corals and sea anemones. But what do we mean by that? So a phylum, a phylum Cnidaria. Well, if we think of all the animals in the world, you can group all the animals in the world to about 36 different types. And each type is called a phylum. And we belong, we're an animal, so we belong to one, one type. We belong to the phylum Cardata. What, I, what that actually means is all birds, reptiles, amphibians, fishes, all these animals are chordates, phylum chordata, and we, have, we share in common the fact that we all have a, vert, a vertebrae or a backbone. In terms of the members of the phylum Cnidaria, so what do they share in common? What do they have? Well, obviously they don't have a, a backbone, the, the complete absence of any hard structures, but what Cnidaria have is a nidae. So their defining characteristic is, is what we call it, is that they have nidae or stinging capsules and nidae comes from the Greek um, nettle. So we're just gonna, this is a picture here of, of, of um, a coral reef. And here we have a picture of a beadlet anemone. And here we have a picture of a compass jellyfish. And all of these animals have these nidae or stinging capsules. And we're gonna look at one particular type, the nematocyst. And this is the type that injects the venom into you if you, if you happen to get stung. So here we have a picture of a lion's mane jellyfish, and we're just going to focus in and look at some of these tentacles here. So the tentacles are these fine hair-like structures um, on this jellyfish. And if we zoom in, you can see that each, uh, just a section of this tentacle, so this is only a couple of millimeters, um, uh, at the scale bar here. But what you can see, if you've got these clusters of little dots, and if we look in at one of those clusters, what we can see is that each cluster contains about 80 to 100 of uh, what we call nematocysts. So each one of these is a nematocyst or a stinging capsule. And then we look at one of them, here's a stinging capsule that's actually fired. So it's actually inject or fired off this tubule that was coiled up inside it. And that's what injects the venom into you when you get stung. Here's a really nice schematic or a, a, a picture of actually um, a nematocyst. So here's the nematocyst here, and it's inside a cell called a nematoblast, and it has a little trigger or the nidocell. So when you, if, if, if a tentacle, or if you brush off a tentacle of a jellyfish, you're, what you're actually doing is you're triggering, you're hitting off this nidocell. That's causing a reaction inside this stinging capsule here, which causes this tubule, which is, it's a bit like a garden hose. Imagine a garden hose coiled up inside. And so water rushes into this, and it's actually then, it's ejected out with such force, like the speed of a bullet, that it, it can actually pierce your skin and inject venom. And uh, it's it, much the way, if you imagine uh, uh, putting water into a hose, it makes it rigid and it can actually um, uh, pierce your skin. 
So that's what a nematocyst is, and that's what all jellyfish have, and uh, that's what makes them uh, part of the phylum Cnidaria. So here's a really nice video um, from Dr. Angel Gahara, who is the world's expert in jellyfish and um, venom. And uh, so I want you to just kind of look along here. So this is a tentacle, and we're going to have a look at uh, some nematocyst firing. And so you can see just the all fire there at the speed of a bullet. So it's a very uh, rapid process. And this is this footage here now is slowed down, so you can see it um, happening a bit uh, in, in, in time. So that's your nematocyst firing there. So if you do, if you're unfortunate to brush up against a jellyfish, that's what's happening. You're getting thousands and thousands of these little nematocysts that are uh, injecting that venom into you. Okay, so now we've looked at the defining characteristic of, of cnidarians and jellyfish and that they have stinging cells or, sting, or stinging capsules. But what about the jelly bits, the jellyfish morphology? Well, um, this, this is a, a really nice picture here. And what you can see is just, there's a, there's a few pieces that are, I've just highlighted. They're very simple animals. They're not like ourselves. Um, they don't have all, this, all the different tissue types that we have. So what they have, they have this bell or the umbrella. So here's an, a drawing of the same, same image. Then they have the tentacles. And a lot of people mistake what, uh, the tentacles for these other structures here. These structures here are called the oral arms. And this particular jellyfish has four oral arms. And you can see these long trailing oral arms. And these are part of the feeding structure. So you have the tentacles around the periphery of the umbrella. So these are the tentacles and they're typically thread-like or hair-like, they're really fine um, um, uh, structures. Whereas the oral arms are, are much thicker and, um, and more robust um, structures. But just a couple of other little pieces to, to show you about a jellyfish. Around that edge of the jellyfish, so now we're looking up at, 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 we're looking down on top of the jellyfish or looking, looking up in this direction, you can see that it's got a symmetry around it and it has these eight structures, what we call ropalium or ropalia. And this is a picture, this is a close-up image of these ropalia. And these are sensory structures. So these are structures that help the animal to orientate itself, to know whether it's upside down or sideways in the water. So um, these are really important and all jellyfish um, all these true jellyfish that we've been talking about today have these uh, ropalium. So they have little um, statocysts and little ocelli, little light sensitive spots in there as well. Okay, so what about the actual life cycle of jellyfish? So most of you be familiar with the jellyfish itself, but how much do you know about the actual the, the life cycle? So um, I thought I'd put in a slide here and a nice illustration. Of, of the life cycle of the lion's mane jellyfish. So believe it or not, here in this picture, the jellyfish can be actually male or female. So this, let's pretend this is a female jellyfish here, and this is a male and a male jellyfish here. So what they actually do is the male jellyfish release their gametes or their sperm into the water, whereas the female, she holds onto her eggs, and then she will take the sperm in inside into the into the umbrella of the actual jellyfish and the sperm will fertilize the eggs and then these fertilized eggs will will develop into what we call a planula so this is a little uh, drawing of a planula they're only um, a couple of hundred microns in diameter so less than a millimeter so really small but i've put this picture in here because if if you if you look down here at the bottom right this kind of white color, that's this, this female um, blue jellyfish actually brooding her young. So believe it or not, so jellyfish can actually brood their young. And that's what we have in this picture here. But the next stage is that we see this planula, this, this, this little larval stage settles down on a rocky substrate somewhere. And typically it's an overhang. So it, it settles underneath something um, and develops into a polyp. And here's a nice uh, polyp image. So this is only a couple of millimeters in size and you can see it's developed tentacles. So it's, it's actually, this animal is, is capable of, of, um, of capturing its own food. At certain times of the year, January, February typically, this polyp 
So this polyp undergoes metamorphosis, just like a, um, a caterpillar metamorphoses into a butterfly. Jellyfish also undergo metamorphosis, but it's, it's a stage we, we typically don't see. So the polyp metamorphoses into a, a different kind of polyp that begins to release, um, oops, begins to release these ephyra. And that's the baby jellyfish. So this is a picture, it's a couple of millimeters, millimeter, millimeters in diameter. And you can see this is the baby jellyfish that will eventually grow up into the adult jellyfish. So when you see some of these large jellyfish washed up on a beach on the, during the summer, or you're in swimming in the water and you see some of these jellyfish um, uh, in the water, the baby jellyfish is actually released into the water in January and February. So just to give you a bit more idea, because I've introduced a lot of, of terminology there and it's kind of hard to avoid that when you're talking about jellyfish, but I've got a, a few little videos here to play. Um, so this is the planula. So remember, these little dots here, these are, this was recorded um, this, this um, August. We, we filmed these little uh, planula running around in our lab um, under the microscope. So you can see them just moving around. So that's what they do, they're swimming around in the water. They're only a couple of hundred millimeters maybe half a millimeter in length. Um, and then they settle down and develop into a polyp. Then eventually that polyp metamorphoses, so it begins to horizontally divide, and then it releases um, what we call the ephyra. And here's a nice little image of, of an ephyra that was captured off Cork Harbor just a couple of a month or two ago. So you can see it pulsating away. So just a baby um, a jellyfish. So that's what they start off baby jellyfish is only a couple of millimeters in diameter. Okay, so, so now we've, we've um, discussed the life cycle. Um, let's begin to talk about the different species of jellyfish that we have here in, in Ireland. And I, I've put up this image because I, I, I really like it. It's, um, these, these were all found on the one beach um, a couple of years ago, I was walking a beach and I found all these jellyfish washed up and it was just nice to kind of put them all together because actually it shows the diversity of species that we have here in Ireland, but it also shows there's a couple of species here that are the same, um, same species, but you wouldn't think it. So, well, I guess the most common jellyfish, and it's called the common jellyfish, is, is the moon jellyfish, so Aurelia areta. And I guess most of you guys will be very familiar with this one because it's the most cosmopolitan. It's found in all Irish coastal waters. And you're likely to see that washed up um, anywhere on our beaches. Um, and so it's, it's actually, in terms of its timing, when do we see it? We see it washed up in April to August. Um, it's saucer shaped. It doesn't get much bigger than a saucer. Um, it's transparent. And then it has these four uh, pink, rings or gonads. That's where the, the, the female eggs or the male sperm would be actually kept in these rings. It has a fringe of over a hundred very fine tentacles around the edge of it. And I'm going to play a video. video. I'll play it now. Show that. So you can see the fringe of, of, uh, of tentacles around the edge of the animal. Um, and one thing that's notable about this animal too is that it has oral arms as well. It has four oral, oral arms and that's where the oral arms are important in the feeding but they also will, they can hold uh, the juveniles or the, 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 the planula. That's a typical size of an Aurelia or common jellyfish. But I guess one of the most spectacular things about the common jellyfish is that it forms these large aggregations and this is, an, this is a gorgeous picture of um, an aggregation or what we call in the jellyfish community, we call a bloom of jellyfish. So this was taken in, in uh, uh, Bantry Bay and it's, you can see the huge numbers of, of moon or common jellyfish all here together. And they do that, it's, it's, it makes sense if, if, if you think about it, if you're a jellyfish out in the ocean swimming by yourself and you wanna find a, 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 a mate, well, if you form these aggregations, it's very easy for them to, um, to produce the next uh, generation. Okay, so the next species that we have is the compass jellyfish. I just want to keep track of our time. Okay, so it's the compass jellyfish. So the compass jellyfish has a, has a different distribution. It's found mostly in the Celtic Sea. We don't find too many compass jellyfish in the Irish Sea. 
although there's pockets of them um, that are that that occur in in Dublin Bay. I've we've definitely seen compass jellyfish in Dublin Bay, but we tend not to get them in in the rest of the Irish Sea. You definitely find them in the Celtic Sea, any of the shores washing up there, and you find them off the west coast and north coast of Ireland. So um, uh, it, it's found from May to August. It's probably our most striking jellyfish, beautifully patterned. It has this strong pattern, 16 triangular or V-shaped markings on the bell. And you can see in this, this image here from, from John Collins, you can see these, these markings here. And then you can see it more clearly on this, this animal on the beach. So it has these V-shaped markings. So no other jellyfish has that. And they've got a very, uh, brown, orange um, pigment. They have 24 tentacles. And again, like the, the moon jellyfish, the tentacles are located around the edge of the umbrella. So they're, they're attached to the edge, edge of the, uh, or the margin of the bell. Um, they can get up to the size of a dinner plate. Um, and they have these four very long frilly, fr frilly oral arms. But you can see there's a lot of variability in, 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 in the patterns of them. Some of them will have, will not have none of these um, V-shaped markings. I've put a little pepper symbol there to show that uh, just here on the left, to show that these guys can actually inflict a sting, but it's, it's, it, it's somewhat like a nettle sting. Um, in terms of size, you can see they can be quite big animals. This is one of the largest we ever measured, over 40 centimeters. Just to show the uh, almost how graceful these animals are in the waters. So you can see the tentacles along the edge and these large oral frilly arms. Obviously, the the, the video is as it's these divers are much bigger in reality to this jellyfish. But there we go. Um, so the mauve stinger. This is this is a species of jellyfish that may not be familiar to everybody. If you live on the west coast from Cork to Donegal. I'm, no doubt you've seen it, but if you if you've lived on the south coast or in the Irish Sea, you may not have seen this species because it rarely washes up in there. Um, it's an oceanic species, and it comes in. It, it's carried into our coastal waters at different times, but typically it's much later. We see it in August to September. It has four pink gonads, but not the rings like the moon jellyfish that we saw. So the gonads, you can see. Um, actually, this image here, you can see the gonads. Um, they're more around the edge, not in, in the rings like we saw in the moon jellyfish. It's, it's not a particularly big jellyfish. At most, it's a, the size of a closed fist. It has eight shoelace tentacles. So the tentacles, when you see on these animals, they can be uh, quite thick. Um, and then they have a bumpy bell. So if you look at it, it's like a golf ball appearance um, when you see these jellyfish washed up. But huge, hugely variable in color. So here's one here that's a juvenile. They're typically golden, golden brown in color. And then the adults here on, these, on this image you can see have this pink or this uh, mauve color. And again, we've put up a little, two chilies for these guys because um, they can inflict a um, bit more of a, of a sting than a nettle sting. So um, you have to be uh, um, wary of these guys. And I guess one of the problems with these guys is that they form these enormous blooms or aggregations. You can have uh, tens of thousands of, of pelagia or mauve stingers all together. And this is an incredible photograph that was taken off um, Donegal uh, many years ago. And um, you could see that they were all swarming um, together. And here's another picture in the shallow waters, just to show you the idea of the abundance of these guys. They can be really, really abundant. Perhaps one of the, the most infamous of, of Irish jellyfish is the, is the lion's mane jellyfish. And um, it has a, a different distribution. It's typically found from Wicklow to Galway. And so north of Wicklow through Dublin, particularly abundant off the east coast of Ireland. Um, so Dublin Bay, off Loud, and, um, all the way up to um, Northern Ireland and across to Donegal, particularly abundant. And then all the way down to uh, Galway. Um, but in the last couple of years, we've had some really unusual reportings and sightings of the lion's mane, even, even as far south as Cork. But in general, this is more of a northern, cooler water species. It has a very distinctive shape, a flower-shaped bell. You can see these eight lobes all the way around it. 
So sometimes you see this is a this is a fabulous picture of 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 a lion's mane jellyfish washed up on the beach near Dublin. And what you can see, you can see the bell here. But often people think like when they measure it, they say, "Oh, it's a huge animal. It was over a meter and a half in diameter." But that's misleading because the actual animal itself, its bell, is what you measure. And that's typically maybe 60, 70, 80 centimeters in diameter. So they can get up to a meter, but it's rare enough to see them that size. And uh, then this is all these, this, this kind of red mass here, that's the oral arms, um, which we call, we call them curtain-like. And I'm gonna show a video in a sec to show what they look like. It can have this deep red brown color and it doesn't form blooms. This picture here is perhaps um, the most you'll ever see together is three, four, five uh, lined main jellyfish. But I forgot to say it has clusters of, it has eight clusters of about a hundred tentacles each and each tentacle can be three to four meters long. And this, this, uh, this fabulous image here from Nula Moore down off Dingle um, a couple of years ago, you can see the tentacles that are spread out almost like a, an exploding star, just tentacles fired off in all directions. So you can see why that can cause um, um, such a problem to swimmers. So it's a big animal um, and probably the most venomous uh, local jellyfish that we have here in Irish water. So it gets three chili peppers. Um, I'm just gonna play a video um, by my colleague, Damien Halberlin here, you'll hear later on tonight. So taken in Killary Harbor. And I think it's great because it just, illustrates the oral arms. Look at it, it's like folds of tissues. I mentioned they're like curtains. So it's, it's very hard to kind of make out structures here, but it's, it's like um, curtains. Imagine these curtains, um, four curtains hanging down from underneath the jellyfish. And they're really important in how helping this animal feed. And then you can see the tentacles um, are spread out here. Um, uh, to capture its food. And you can see the, the, the flower shaped pattern of the bell on this animal. But you can also see some juvenile fish um, hanging around this jellyfish. So they do that for protection because if you're hanging out with a big venomous animal like this, nobody else is going to touch you. So you can see the role that these animals play in, in, um, in our, in our uh, ecosystems. So one of the other species that we have and Let's see how we're doing with time. Okay, um, it's the blue jellyfish or Cyania lamarckii. This is very closely related to the to the to the lion's mane jellyfish. It's like a um, a close cousin. Um, it has a cosmopolitan distribution. It's found all around Ireland. Typically found from May to August. Again, it has that flower-shaped bell with eight lobes, and um, but it has shorter tentacles because it never really gets up to the same size. It, it never gets much bigger than your, you know, your hand or maybe at most uh, 20, 20, 30 centimeters in diameter. Um, it has this distinctive blue uh, violet uh, color. So you can see some images of it here, but it can also be yellow and sometimes it can actually be transparent. So that often leads to misidentification of, of this species. Sometimes it can be quite tricky, especially when you, if you have a lion's mane jellyfish that is the same size as a blue jellyfish, they're very tricky to, to, um, to separate. They do inflict a sting, but nowhere is as, as serious as the, as the lion's mane jellyfish. And, and this, if you did get into it, it's, it's one of these things, is this, is, this a, is this a juvenile lion's mane jellyfish or is it a blue jellyfish that has a yellow tinge? And the only way to, de to, de to determine that is you kind of have to turn, turn them upside down. They have these muscle folds, and then you can see there's these little pit-like intrusions on the lion's mane. Then you have to count the number of tentacles. So these guys have approximately 7 to 150. These guys have much less. So that's the only way you can distinguish some of these that are um, kind of yellowy in color that are about the same size as a blue. But clearly, if it's a blue jellyfish that has blue color, it's a blue jellyfish and nothing else. Now, here's perhaps the most unusual jellyfish we have in Irish waters, and this is the barrel jellyfish, or Rhizostoma octopus. And um, they have a very distinctive distribution as well, really only found in great abundance in Rosslare Harbor and the small pockets of them in Wicklow Harbour. 
a few of them wash up from time to time in Dublin Bay, on, uh, on, um, on Loud, on some of the beaches in Loud. But really, this is a, this is a species that is confined to the, to the, to the river um, or uh, just outside Rosslare Harbour. And you can get tens of thousands. Imagine that these animals can weigh up to 30 kg. So here's a nice picture of one. You can see the size of it. Um, they're really big animals. So this is a diver, um, just to show the scale, really big animals. They don't have any tentacles. So these structures that you're looking at here, um, they're the oral arms. So those structures hanging underneath the umbrella, they're actually the feeding structures. So this animal, if you were ever, it's a good qui uh, quiz question, what animal has more, well, has thousands of mouths? Well, the barrel jellyfish does. These oral arms have thousands of, of, um, of, of little mouths that essentially are sucking in, sucking in plankton, um, which they feed on. And you can see they look a bit like um, cauliflower florets, like if you look closely at these. And the name octopus comes from the fact that it has these eight oral arms. So it has no tentacles. It feeds by creating a flow of water around, um, around as it swims. Well, let's actually look at that. Here's a video. So a really strong swimmer. You can see the oral arms here. As it's swimming along, water gets entrained in amongst um, the oral arms, and that's, where it, that's how it captures its food. You can see there's a, a purple frilly edge, and then you can see the little clefts. That's where the ropalia or the sensory structures are on this animal. Okay, so that's the barrel jellyfish. At times, you can get tens of thousands of these animals in, in Rosslair um, uh, actually swimming together. So very, very different animal to most of the jellyfish that we have here in Ireland. Okay, so we've looked at, really we have six, what we call true jellyfish species here in Ireland. And uh, we've, just, we've just looked at those. I've talked about the different structures and how to distinguish the different types. We also have a couple of what we call honorary jellyfish, and I'm going to go through those very quickly. I'm not going to go in, into them as the same detail as the other species. So the Portuguese man of war, it's not a true jellyfish. It's actually a siphonophore, um, which is related. It does have stinging uh, capacity, and hence it's got the three red uh, chili peppers over here. Um, but this is a nice picture of one washed up. Over the last four years, we've had unprecedented numbers of Portuguese man, war, man of war washing up in our coastal waters, but they're a colonial organism. So they have a float um, that sits on the surface here like that. And then they have all these different individual zooids or some are feeding pollets, some ha are, uh, have, are defensive in purpose and they have these large tentacles. So let's, let's just have a look at this video from uh, just to show absolutely beautiful, stunning animals. And this, this video really does them uh, justice. But hopefully you get to see the tentacles as well. So you can see the float and how it's acting. The wind is blowing it. So these animals are carried by the wind. And they get their name because the, the actual sail and the color is supposed to uh, be or look something like a, a man of warship. I'm just going to bring this on just to show you the tentacles here. Just watch these tentacles now. So they've got muscles running all the way up along the tentacles. So they can, con they can contract them when they want to. So we'll just watch this just for a second. We'll see them contract their tentacles. There they go. Okay, so that's the Portuguese man of war. Not a true jellyfish, but it is actually um, related. Closely related to the Portuguese man of war are these really unusual animals and probably the longest animal on the planet. And it's the pearl uh, string jellyfish. And this is also a colonial um, organism. But you can see, this is a picture. If anybody knows who took this picture, we'd greatly appreciate it because I've lost, um, I've lost uh, the name of the photographer of this photograph, but I know it was off Cork by uh, some diver down here. But you can see this animal is perhaps you know, 10 meters in length. But there's a recent video that's, that was, went around that showed some of these animals to be 
um, you know, easily uh, 30, 40 meters in length. And here's a close up of, a, of, a, of one of these uh, that has broken, broken off, so much smaller. So that's the pearl stream jellyfish. Um, then we have, uh, this is a species you might see washed up on the beach, which is the crystal jellyfish. They also belong to the Cnidarians, but they're called hydromedusae. Don't worry too much about the terminology, but if you see this guy, they are crystal clear, and that's where they get their name from. When they wash up, you, they're almost completely transparent, almost like a piece of glass. But then you can see, the distinguishing thing is you can see these, these little radial lines all along the umbrella. And that's what distinguishes it from the, the moon jellyfish, because these guys can get, to the, uh, can get to be about the size of a moon jellyfish. This is a really lovely image here, and it shows a crystal jellyfish feeding on all these other little small jellyfish down here. So similar to the crystal jellyfish, we have these other jellyfish called um, little jellyfish, but there's maybe 20 different species that we find here in Ireland. This is one that I particularly like, it's called Lucartiaria. Um, you'd often see that swimming around, it's about a centimeter, so maybe a centimeter and a half in length. This is another one that you never really see unless you look under a microscope, it's only a, less than a millimeter in uh, this image, I think. Um, so just, it's just something to be aware of. While you know, we're talking about the six true jellyfish, there's lots of smaller jellyfish-like animals that are out there too. And then this is one of the species, the by the wind sailor, that I'm sure many of you have actually seen washed up on your beaches. And um, this is closely related to the, to, the, um, to the little jellyfish. And I really like this picture because I guess um, this picture could be taken nowhere else um, than Ireland because they're Hurley and Slitter. But um, Valella are an oceanic species found throughout the world. Um, and often you just see them washed up dead like this. You can see that they've lost their pigments and uh, uh, here on these ones, you know, they're quite old. And then some of the last, the last group of jellyfish I just really wanted to talk about were tinophores. And this is a sea gooseberry here, and this is another guy called uh, Baroi. And you see these guys swimming around, but they don't have any tentacles or stinging, or don't have any stinging capacity. So they're a completely different group of animals. So lastly, I just wanna, I wanna try and bring this all together and just to kind of um, summarize the relationships how are all of these different types of jellyfish uh, related to each other and um, help you guys to, to understand jellyfish a bit more in, 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 and uh, appreciate them in that kind of wider diversity of organisms that are out there. So tonight we've really just been looking at the phylum Nidaria and what I have here is just a little, essentially it's a, um, I'm just going to put up a little uh, laser pointer here. So we're just looking at how these different animals are related. So we looked at the Antozoa, so your corals and sea anemones at the start, we know that they're in the phylum Cnidaria. We did look at box jellyfish, but box jellyfish are something that are also in the group of Cnidarians, and obviously they're, they're, most people would have heard of them, but uh, we don't have any of these in Irish waters. But box jellyfish are actually uh, closely related to the true jellyfish that we just looked at here, and here's a picture of the moon jellyfish. And these guys, what they share in common is that they have they all have polyps. So we looked at polyps. We saw that in the life cycle of the true jellyfish that they have a polyp. So we know these guys are actually related. But then we saw this, this motley crew of, of honorary jellyfish that are over here. We saw the Portuguese man of war. We saw Lucartiaria. We saw the crystal jellyfish and we saw the by, wind, by the wind sailor. These all fall under a group of animals called the hydrozoa. So together we have the anthozoa, cubozoa, skiffozoa, and hydrozoa, and then um, they all belong within the phylum Cnidaria. And the last group we looked at was the phylum Tenophora, and that's the tenophores. And what you can see is that they're not connected here, so we have to go way back in time before these guys share a common ancestor. But what we can see here is that sea, uh, sea anemones, corals, uh, uh, a box jellyfish, true jellyfish, Portuguese man of war, crystal jellyfish, by the wind sellers, we can just see the relationships that they all share together. Lastly, um, I just want to pay a bit of homage to Maud Delap. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of her, but Maud Delap, over 120 years ago, she did some pioneering work here in Ireland. So um, she cultured this jellyfish here, which is the um, compass jellyfish. She managed to culture that in, in Valencia in her kitchen. So you, she used to roll out and catch 
um, uh, compass jellyfish and she managed to culture them and rear them. And what we know, what, a lot of what we know today um, stems from a lot of that earlier work that Maud de Lapp did um, over a hundred years ago down in Valencia. So I just want to tip our hat to, uh, to Maud because a lot of the research that, that myself and all my uh, colleagues here, Damien and PhD students and, and some colleagues in the past, all the work that we've done on jellyfish um, builds on a lot of the work that, that Maud de Lapp did. And then lastly, I'd just like to thank all of you guys because um, over the last, I guess, um, certainly 10 or 12 years, we've had the big jellyfish hunt Facebook page. If any of you are not familiar with it, certainly uh, uh, please join and, and uh, submit your sightings. But a lot of the photographs we've shown here tonight are, are from you guys. And uh, I'd just like to acknowledge that all those sightings that you've sent in that really helped us um, understand what's going on with Irish jellyfish. And, um, and finally, I'd just like to thank Clean Coast um, for uh, organizing this event and bringing all you guys here together. Um, and hopefully we'll have a, a nice discussion about jellyfish now. Thank you. Thanks for that, Tom. That was great, that was comprehensive. Thank you. I feel like I've learned a lot. I was like making notes, but, uh, and been transported into another world. Um, so thanks so much. So um, again, a few people joined it. I think what we'll, we'll do now is we'll open it up a little bit. Um, you know, we'll, I'm, I have it now in gallery view. You can see it on the top right. Sorry, I'm bad with the right and left. So if you, you know, you can change to gallery view so you can see a few faces, which might be a little bit nicer way to have a chat about it. Um, it's not just Tom we have here. We have a second jellyfish expert, uh, Damien as well. Um, so I'm instead of like going through the questions and answers, Damien is much better positioned to kind of go through your questions and, and put them to Tom. So I'm going to throw it over to Damien. He's a jellyfish expert also in University College Cork, and he also does the big jellyfish hunt with uh, Tom Doyle. Hi, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to see such a diversity of faces looking back. I, I can see people of every age, and that's pretty cool, actually, <laughs> to, to realize that we're reaching quite a, a wide sort of section of the community. It's really, really gratifying and nice to see. Um, I'm not gonna waffle on too much because people have kind of given me some questions to ask already. And uh, the first one is about stinging. Uh, Colm Brennock, I hope I've uh, pronounced that correctly. He wants to know what, uh, I suppose, if you could just discuss Tom sting treatment because I think it's fair to say in the last couple of years, there's been maybe conflicting or differing advice, which has come out of different jurisdictions. Yeah, well, actually, um, I, I'm going to share my screen again because I, I, I preempted this question. I thought we might, somebody might ask this question. So um, let me just uh, look at our slides again. And here we go. Um, can, can you see that, Damien, now? Yeah, I can see that, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, there's, 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 there's definitely um, conflicting advice on this in terms of uh, the treatment of jellyfish. But what we are recommending as a, or what we've shown from the research that we've done is that it's a two-stage process. So what I would do, and I know Damien would do likewise, is if you get stung, you would pour vinegar onto the wound for 30 seconds. So that's a rinse. And so you rinse the, the injured area first. So, so if you're stung, you rinse it with vinegar. And what that actually does, it, it stops the nematocyst. So we had a look at nematocyst areas. So it stops the nematocyst from firing. But once you want to apply vinegar, you've already been stung. So some of the venom is already inside of you. So the next step is to actually apply a 45 degree um, Celsius hot pack for 40 minutes. Um, or apply um, essentially, yeah, so a hot pack, and you're probably wondering where do we get them? Well, you can actually buy um, hot packs that are at 45 degrees Celsius because it is difficult. But essentially what you need to do is get, uh, apply a hot treatment to that area. So it's like hot bath water. Do you know when you're stepping into a bat, uh, bat uh, or tub of bath water that is just on the edge of what you can bear? That's about 45 degrees. But, um, so it's this two-stage process in terms of the treatment. That's what we do. But it's in conflict with 
the current recommendations here in Ireland, um, which uh, has a different recommendation. So we can't, what we're saying is this is the science, this is what we've done. And um, we've worked with some uh, pretty, pretty uh, um, uh, important experts on jellyfish venom on this. So what we've shown is that it's a two-stage process. So vinegar first to rinse the wound to stop any uh, further nematocysts from injecting venom into your body. And then the next step is to apply a hot pack for about 40 minutes. So you want to treat that area, um, which that treats the venom that's already inside your body and it stops it from doing any damage. Okay. Cool, thanks Tom. Uh, actually, there's, a, there's a, an interesting question that's come up from uh, Dahi or Lenard. Uh, have we lost or gained any species because of climate change, because of changing sea temperature? Uh, well, that, that's a really interesting question. And it's, it's, I guess what you could say is that the Portuguese man of war has arrived on our shores couple of years um, definitely we're, we're, we're seeing more Portuguese man of war um, if you look back historically and I've, a, I've um, a PhD student Jasmine and she's doing a lot of work on this but what she's shown is that over the last 100 years we've only had maybe three two occasions when we've had hundreds and hundreds of Portuguese man of war washing up on our shores but if you think about it, in the last four years from from October to November We've had hundreds, greater than 500 Portuguese man of war wash up in our waters. So it is likely that um, Portuguese man of war have um, kind of pushed that bit further north. It could be to do with wind. We're certainly getting a lot more storms. So it could be storms that are actually pushing Portuguese man of war up into, in, into Irish waters more regularly. But I guess it's only four years that we've had them, but it, it does suggest that we're going to see them more often because if you look in the Bay of Biscay, up until maybe 10, 15 years ago, the Bay of Biscay didn't get too many Portuguese men of war, but now it's a regular occurrence in the Bay of Biscay. So perhaps we're going to see Portuguese men of war wash up here um, probably every year, but um, you know, only time will tell. Then in terms of other species, we have had a new species, and believe it or not, we have the freshwater jellyfish that um, was recorded a couple of years ago in the, in the River Shannon in Loch Darg. So, so um, that was a new species to us and it was actually quite surprising because literally the day before I was in the Killarney Lakes um, with my family and one of my kids put his hand in the water and then he quickly took it out and he said, um, Dad, do we have, we don't have any freshwater jellyfish. And I said, no, we don't, but they do a car across the globe, but we don't have any. And literally the next day I got a call to say, um, Tom, do you know anything about jellyfish in Loch Derg? So. So, it, it, you know, there, that's a, a new species. We don't know how long that's got here, but that's, that's been introduced. Um, there's possibly one or two species that have been introduced, but we haven't found them yet. Um, so, so, so hopefully that's um, answered um, your question, Dottie. Uh, do you have do many cases of this recorded, or was it just that? Um, it, was, it was in one year. Um, I'm trying to remember what year it was. Um, uh, it doesn't. 14, I think. Was it 14? Thanks, Demo. Um, and we got quite a lot. It was, it was all the way, it, it was Derg Loch Ree. I think it was in the Yarn system as well. And, but that was an exceptional summer and the water temperatures got really high. They got above, um, I can't remember, was it 17, 18 degrees in some parts of, of, or maybe even 20 in some of the shallow parts of, of the, the Shannon. And it's a, it's a warmer water species, so it requires that warm temperature before you see the jellyfish in the water. So, um, so that was quite unusual. Actually, it was it was 2013 because that was our exceptional heat wave when we we hit like 29, 30 degrees in parts of the country. But uh, that freshwater jelly is an interesting one because not only does it, I suppose, speak to climate change, but it also is a real fascinating uh, example of an invasive species. And that we think probably started, um, it's, it's basically spread around the entire world from Asia and probably spread on, um, on plants that were used in garden aquaria and in indoor aquariums. I know it's everywhere. It's throughout Europe. It's throughout North America. Uh, so it's really fascinating, but I would, I would just add that it doesn't appear to really 
impact um, ecosystems all that much when it has spread. So if you get a chance to look, look into that, it's a really fascinating kind of case history of an invasive species. Uh, we've now, have a good question actually, Tom, from uh, Nick Davies in the Isle of Man. And he's wondering, why do we see barrel jellyfish all year round and not just in the summertime? And are, are they feeding in the winter, he asks specifically. Uh, great question, Nick, and, um, and a fabulous species. And gr great to hear that you, you're actually seeing it all year round. And we'd, we'd love to hear more of those sightings uh, that you have. But it, it's, it is one of those questions that we have as a jellyfish community. We're pretty, well, we're not, we, we're pretty uh, sure that these jellyfish overwinter. Um, because when you think about it, remember we sh I showed you some um, images of what an ephyra, a baby jellyfish, looks like, and that's only a couple of millimeters in size, and they typically are released into the water in January, February. So a couple of millimeters in January, February, but by April we see barrel jellyfish that are, are maybe 60, 70 centimeters in diameter, so they can weigh 15, 20 kg, so they haven't suddenly just appeared being released from a polyp. So we know they're overwintering, but we've very few observations of, of barrel jellyfish actually um, during the winter months and where they actually go. So we think they sit on the seabed. We think as the water temperature gets colder, they slow down, they just sit on the seabed. But we don't actually have much um, photo, photo evidence or any other evidence of that. The only evidence we have is that in October, November, we certainly see really large uh, barrel jellyfish swimming around. And then come March, early March, sometimes we get sightings of barrel jellyfish swimming in the water column. So it's, we, def we definitely love to hear more about your observations. Um, I don't think there's much, there's, not a, there's definitely some food around in the winter months, but not enough that these animals will actually stay up in the water column. But it's an interesting, it, it's an interesting jellyfish to think about. Most other jellyfish, their summer, they um, and they've evolved to, to be summer specialists because the water's calmer. There's lots of plankton around. That's when they grow. That's when they feed. That's when they reproduce. And then they release the 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 planula into the water so that they'll have polyps for next year. Whereas barrel jellyfish, they have a different strategy. They're probably um, they're overwintering on the seabed, and that's because they're really tough jellyfish. If you've ever if you've ever seen one of these washed up on a beach. They're solid, you, you know, um, they're not like any other jellyfish. So they're tough, they can overwinter and then come March, April, they can appear up in the water column and be ready to, to, to feed on that phytoplankton and zooplankton that's in the water column and then to really grow even bigger and reproduce and have a, a good reproductive strategy. So, so a really good question and a really nice species. Thank you very much, Tom. I'll add some data as soon as I um start to observe and then make sure that you get that. Um, most of the time I've seen small jellyfish in the winter about three or four meters down when the water's been very clear and um, uh, they seem to be swimming slowly not like an adult in the summer. Um, um, it's interesting what you say about them coming up to feed more. Fantastic that's that's, that's wonderful observations. I'd really, you know, if you have photo, photos or, or footage of that, or even just your observations, that'd be brilliant if you could please send that on because it is one of those species that we're still not quite sure about what they do in the winter months. So even that observation that you've seen them um, swimming around um, in, in, in shallow waters um, or uh, just near the bottom, that's fabulous, fabulous stuff. So um, thanks for being. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot of the, there's a lot of people interested in questions on a sort of temperature and 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 what temp temperature or what effect it has on the jellyfish. So um, E Mooney, I think uh, she's asking, are jellyfish similar to coral in their reaction to rising seawater temperature, and have we noticed any differences in the past few years? What? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. These are, again, these are uh, tough questions. Is this being recorded? Um, uh, that's a, a great question. Temperature, temperature certainly plays a large role in jellyfish. Um, the difference with coral, 
coral have um, a symbiotic relationship with a with a zooxanthella or a, a a type of 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 algae, and so when the temperature gets too hot, the the coral expel those algae, and so then that relationship breaks down, and coral can't survive as well without that that relationship that I have with those symbi uh, symbiotic um, algae. Most jellyfish don't have that. But in saying that, there is some suggestion that maybe uh, the barrel jellyfish does have some sort of uh, symbionts with it. Um, by the wind sailors, those little guys that float on the surface, they have a, a zooxanthella a symbiotic relationship as well. Um, but in terms of temperature, um, temperature is, seems to be really important in, in the polyp stage. So it may be a really important trigger in, in the timing of when the polyps release their baby ephyra. Um, so temperature is really important at that stage. It clearly plays an important role as well in the adult medusa, helping them to mature um, and to produce and, and, and to, um, you'd often see barrel jellyfish right up at the surface and there's some idea that they'll, um, uh, they can have a, have a you know, they're, they can grow, their, or their gonads can develop faster in the higher temperature. So temperature does play a role. Um, it's probably more important at that polyp stage, but it's not quite the same uh, issue that, that corals have. But a great question. I think as well, it's a, it's a really interesting question, but it's, it's worth remembering, I suppose, in, in the tropics, temperature probably vary. Like if, if you take, for instance, the Great Barrier Reef, the temperature might vary about four degrees Celsius across the entire year. And I guess it gets a bit warmer in some of these very warm years now where you see the bleaching. But around temperate places like Ireland and the UK, the temperature can go from eight, maybe seven and a half, eight degrees in the winter, and you can hit 21, 22, possibly even 23 degrees in, in bays and estuaries. So the animals experience quite different conditions. So when we say a warm summer, a warm summer those jellyfish only experience those conditions for maybe two months, as opposed to in the tropics where these species live in that environment for their entire life. So these kinds of things have a, a massive impact on, on sort of life history and, and reproduction. So I think in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly where we are, you get these pulses of life, you know, you get these spring blooms and that, and as Tom said, the, the uh, reproduction of the polyps and then the spring bloom and how the jellyfish can, um, can profit from that spring bloom maybe that's, they're some of the big factors. Uh, speaking of big questions, Tom, here's, here's a, we're, go, we're, get, we're gonna get philosophical now, I think. <laughs> what, is, what is the lifespan of a jellyfish? Um, um, right, okay, so if we, if we just look at the common jellyfish, if we look at the medusa or the, 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 the animal that we see swimming around that we know as the true jellyfish or the common jellyfish, that's probably only in the water from January, February, and then come June, July, those guys are, are dying off and they've, they're spent, they've released their, their gonads or their, their um, gametes. So, you know, when you're looking at that way, you're looking at six, seven months. And some of these jellyfish may only live in the water column. But it's a really good question because the polyps that we looked at um, that are only a couple of millimeters in size, there's, there's, there's some of those polyps, uh, they can live for 20, 30, 30 years. So some people have kept polyps in, in, um, in aquaria and they still have them 30 years later. So, so the polyp stage, and it, maybe it wasn't, uh, I didn't explain it actually in the, in the life cycle, when the polyp undergoes metamorphosis, so when it begins to transform and release those baby jellyfish, once it's released those baby jellyfish, maybe a couple of them, maybe five or six baby jellyfish, then it turns back into the polyp and stays on the sea floor. And then next, the following year, it does the same thing again and it releases more um, ephyra um, or baby jellyfish into the water. So, so it's not quite like, it, it, it's kind of, it's difficult in the sense that we're used to, uh, thinking of life, a life or the longevity of something in, in human terms and that, you know, we're born and then we live to a certain age. 
But these guys have these two different stages. They have the, the medusa or the bell that swims around in the water. And that has a very defined uh, uh, lifespan like we do. So maybe six to seven months. And like Nick Davies was saying there with the barrel jellyfish, they may overwinter. So they probably live, they could possibly live a year or more. We're not sure. Um, but the polyps, those structures, those little guys that only a couple of millimeters of size that live on the sea structures or on the sea uh, bed somewhere, they can, they can be living for, for tens of years if they're not eaten by something. And then every January, they release baby jellyfish. So it's, it's, um, so how long does a jellyfish live is, as Damien said, it's, it's, a it's almost, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky question. Um, but hopefully, hopefully that, that's answered that question. Well, actually there's one other thing we could add. There's, there, there is one little jellyfish that's called the immortal jellyfish. And we looked at some of them, the guy Lucartiaria, and we looked at another little jellyfish or what we call the hydromedusa. Well, there's, there's one jellyfish called the immortal jellyfish that lives out of a little jellyfish swimming around. And then if things get bad, it can turn back into a polyp on the seabed somewhere and live as a polyp for a while. And then when things are good, it can turn back into a, a medusa and it can just keep doing that. And there's a guy in Japan and there's a guy in Italy who've been working with these guys. And essentially these guys can potentially live forever. Just keep going back between being a, a, a swimming medusa or being a polyp. And uh, it's only something, if something comes along and eats it, well, then it's gone. But other than that, they can live forever. Thanks, Tom. Uh, there's, one, there's another very broad question. I, I think we've kind of touched on this quite a bit uh, in any event. Uh, Claire Young is asking, um, what are the ecological drivers of jellyfish blooms? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is a, an easy one. Is is it um, time for a break? I think um, I'll throw that one over to you, Damien. <laughs> uh, well, I think we've touched on temperature, um, and when you have very small animals, especially like some of the the really small um, hydrozoan species that Tom talked about, and the and the polyp stage, which is quite minute. I think when you when you've anything that small, if you increase the temperature, usually you will get an increase in reproductive rate. It's not always straightforward and it's not always uh, linear, but um, it's sort of a, a rule of thumb in nature, I think. When animals get a lot bigger, like to our size, obviously that, that rule breaks down because we're, we're well past um, cellular activity. You know, we're, we're massive complex animals. So temperature is important at the very small stage. Uh, and then second, you would have your food resource. If you have lots of food available at the right time, a population of jellyfish can really uh, prosper. And I think you can get a bloom. So it's, it's a combination of how they reproduce, the conditions under which they're reproducing, and then the conditions that the very young jellyfish are, are living in and the food available. So if you, if you get lots of reproduction at the polyp stage, and uh, when those baby ephyrae, those tiny little medusa are released and there's lots of food and, and they get a good start, then you, get, then you get a chance for a really big population. And I, I think those are the underpinnings of jellyfish blooms. And there's a genetic component as well because not every species actually forms blooms. There's a strong genetic component. Yeah, actually I'll just add to what you're saying, uh, Damien there. Actually that's, that's, I was just gonna add in that one thing is that not all species form form uh, form blooms. So, like we saw the common jellyfish, that forms blooms. That's that's what it does. It's part of its life history. That's what it it that's what they do. And and how to do that is a combination of what Damien's talking about. But also, at the polyp stage, each polyp will release maybe up to ten ephyra. Mm -hmm. So they re they'll release a lot of ephyra at the same time. And then, so in many ways, that jellyfish bloom that we see during the summer months happens in January and February, but they're only really small and we don't see them. Whereas other species like um, the lion's mane jellyfish, they rarely, they don't release as many polyps um, at all, or uh, uh, as many uh, ephyra uh, um, as an Aurelia would, uh, the common jellyfish. So there's a combination of factors there um, that, that um, cause blooms, but it's certainly an area of interest and it's something that we're fascinated by, you know, 
why, how did jellyfish balloons form? How did they actually stay together? You know, when you think about it, jellyfish don't have visual perception like we do. But if you think of, if, if you think of um, flocks, flocks of birds like starlings, um, if you think of uh, a school of fish and you see them all kind of um, shoaling together, how, how do jellyfish that are really non-visual animals, how do they all stay together in these huge aggregations? And that's something that we're fascinated by and we're, we've, we're, we've been trying to solve it. And, uh, and it's something, it's an active area of research that we're, that we're working on, but a, a great question. Uh, thanks, Min, for this. It's been great. Really, really enjoyed it. Just wondering, does uh, do jellyfish attract uh, a specific type of predator? Uh, good question, Donald. Um, I guess it's it's one of those things, and it's how how I got into jellyfish is 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 my PhD was on studying turtles and uh, feed on jellyfish. Um, uh, well, some particular species like the leatherback sea turtle, they're specialized predators of, of jellyfish. But until, I guess for a long time, people used to think that very few animals feed on jellyfish because they're 96, 97% water. So, so why, why would you feed on a jellyfish? Um, so, but what we've seen over the last 10 years, certainly there's been a lot of research that has shown that there, there is actually quite a diversity of animals that feed on jellyfish. And it's, and, and, uh, and it's quite surprising the animals that do. So believe it or not, a lot of fish, a lot of fish species feed on jellyfish. Um, um, there's a recent study using, using uh, molecular techniques that they were able to, because well, the problem that we have is that, how do you know if an animal is fed on a jellyfish? Because if, you know, for a sea turtle, you can see the sea turtle chomping on the jellyfish and we can make visual observations. But often what we know about who eats who, who eats whom in the ocean, it's from uh, finding the animal washed up dead and then you look at its good contents, you look at what's inside its stomach and then you see what it's been feeding on. And because jellyfish have no hard parts and um, you don't detect them in the stomach, so it's been very difficult. But a lot of techniques recently using molecular methods They've been able to look at the, genet or the genetic material in the stomach and they've identified that the likes of herring, mackerel, lots of different fish feed on jellyfish. So, so why we don't see it, it's certainly happening. And it can be really important at the juvenile stage, like certain species of fish, um, some flatfish uh, feed on some very tiny jellyfish during, during their juvenile stage. And if they don't get those jellyfish, they won't develop. So they can be very important. And then um, there's been a lot of camera work lately where people have put the cameras on penguins, on seabirds, on lots of different animals and shown that penguins are even feeding on, on jellyfish. But they're not just feeding on the, the entire jellyfish. They can actually be quite selective where they're, they're, they're nibbling at the gonads, which will, um, will have a much higher um, energy density or more nutrients in the gonads than actually in the rest of the tissue. So, so it's a great question. And we do know now that, that there's... There's a couple of hundred species of fish feed on jellyfish. A lot of seabirds, you'd often see seabirds um, coming down and picking at jellyfish. And of course, jellyfish act as, and we saw some footage of jellyfish with little juvenile fish swimming around them. And there's some evidence that birds will use jellyfish to find those little fish. So they can act in all sorts of ways, but jellyfish play a much more important role in our, in our marine systems than we previously thought. So, um, so great question. And thanks for asking that, Donald. Um, there's a, uh, Edward asked a similar question, Tom, and I think you've kind of answered it, but I, I would just add something as well that a lot of jellyfish eat each other, and that adds a huge complexity to the, you know, when we're thinking about the food web and what eats what and, and where the energy flows through it, through the, our coastal ecosystem. For instance, the compass jelly really likes to eat lots of other types of jellyfish. And uh, the the sort of uh, the mauve colored uh, tinafore that Tom showed you, the Baroi. The Baroi like to feed on sea gooseberries, the other uh, tinafore. So it gets really complicated. You know, everything likes to eat everything. If you're, if you're usually in the ocean, if you're big enough, you can eat something else. Um, so guys, there's a few more questions coming in. We kind of wrap up on the next few questions, but we will be sending you out a meal as well from Clean Coast and anyone who sent it to the event. 
Um, I'm hoping to convince Damien and, and Tom to answer a few more questions to camera so we can post it on the Clean Coast site if they'd agree to do so. So we might do that at a later stage. So please do send in any other questions or if you look back over the presentation. Um, so th there was one more question there that kind of came in. Um, is there any jellyfish recipes? I think there's a lot of jellyfish recipes, but <laughs> I don't think you're going to get them in Little or Aldi. <laughs> None of your favour. Um, uh, in Asia, they've been eating jellyfish for uh, at least a thousand years, I believe, possibly even yeah. longer. Um, yeah. And I have very specific ways of preparing it, um, and they, they use it in lots of different ways. And I've actually eaten it myself once, and um, it wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> it just tasted like slimy uh, soya sauce, like cold. That's <laughs> Yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting one. Um, there's a project in Europe right now and they're, they're looking at um, new ways that we can, that we can um, use jellyfish. Um, and like certainly from an Irish perspective, the barrel jellyfish is, is an edible um, uh, type of jellyfish. That don't, don't go running out there now and you see one and pick it up on the beach and, and uh, they need a lot of preparation before you can do anything with them. Um, but there is interest in the Irish Sea. There, there is a company in Wales that is actually uh, capturing barrel jellyfish. And um, while they're not actually being processed for the food industry, they're being processed for um, collagen. Um, a lot of what jellyfish are made up is a type of collagen, so they can be used in, uh, in, in kind of medicine kind of or medicinal purposes and a couple of different things like that. So. So jellyfish are, there, there are different unusual uses that you wouldn't think of, but in terms of recipes, I, I, I don't have any um, myself and um, I don't think uh, my buyer would appreciate uh, if I threw up a couple of jellyfish. I'm <laughs> not sure if they'd eat it. Yeah, but, that would be a hard sell. Just yeah. to add to that as well, um, we, we kind of laugh at the, the thought of eating jellyfish, but it's actually a multi-million uh, dollar industry in Asia. And they don't just fish them in Asia, they fish them in the Gulf of Mexico and they ship them to Asia and, and Asian people in the Americas eat them. And it's quite a big industry actually, so it's um, not very appealing to us. But. but there's options out there for you, <laughs> if, you're, if you're so inclined. Uh, well, okay guys, so I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there um, and wrap it up, but I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, and of course, Tom and Damien, fantastic to have you on. Um, it was a great chat. I, I know I learned a lot, so I hope everyone did join. Um, and if you have anything else that you want to throw in, send us an email, send us a message, and I'll make sure it gets through to, to Tom and Damien. Great. Okay. And thanks a million, everybody. Thanks for participating and, and uh, asking questions. Some great questions, actually, really yeah. through our paces. So uh, thanks so much. And, and, and thank you, Sinead, for, for for actually um, suggesting this. It was a great idea and uh, we should do more. So uh, thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.